Hello, Business 330 students. <clears throat> this is Professor Hassey. This is our week three lecture video, The Past, Present, Future in Finance. Simply, Chapter 5, The Time Value of Money. The first two weeks of our class, which was highlighted by Assignment 1 and 2, now we have the third week where we concentrate on the key, one of the key concepts of financial management, the value of money. We've learned about what finance is in relationship to the markets. You're beginning to study the markets in your portfolio analysis. We learn about how important accounting data is to finance management, to be able to understand the financial statements, the balance sheet, the income statement, and the statement of cash flow. Now we look at another key area of financial management, understanding future value, present value, annuity, amortization, all key concepts of the time value of money. And we're highlighting this that in this week's assignment number two, which is posted to Blackboard and due on a September 10th, Sunday. So let's take a look at the past, present, and future in finance. What is future value? Future value is the value that a sum of money today will be worth at some point in the future if invested for a return. Suppose you have $100 today and an investment opportunity that offered you a 10% return if held in that investment for one year. If you were to put your money in that 10% investment vehicle and let it grow at 10%, it would be worth $110 in one year. This means that the future value of your $100 in one year is $110. Now for the future value formula. There are three pieces of information needed to calculate the future value. We need to know the present value, which is the amount of money today, which is represented by PV. We need to know what the interest rate or rate of return investment opportunities are offering. This will be the discount rate when finding present value. And we finally need to know how many periods the investment will be held, represented by N. When conducting this formula, you need to make sure the N and I match. In other words, if I is an annual percentage rate, then E and N, your periods, need to be years. If I is a semi-annual interest rate, then N would be six-month periods. Let's do some examples. If we were to invest $100 at 10% for one year, it would grow to $110. If we were to keep that same $100 in the account and allowed it to grow an additional 10%, it would grow to $121. Now that in the first year, our investment grew $10, but in the second year, it grew $11. This is because of compounding. In the second year, not only did we earn 10% interest on our $100 investment, but we also earned 10% interest on the interest earned from the previous year. So what is present value? Present value is today's value of a future cash flow. Now just about everyone knows that $100 received today is greater than $100 received in the future. This is because of two main factors, investment opportunities and of course inflation. But what about future amounts that have a greater face value? How do we compare those future values to values today? To be able to answer these present value problems, you need three key pieces of information. You need to know the amount of the future cash flow being analyzed. You need to know when you will receive the cash flow to determine how many periods it will need to be discounted. And you need to know the discount rate. What is the discount rate? The discount rate is the opportunity cost that you have foregone when making a financial decision. More specifically, the discount rate is the rate of return you could have earned by an alternative investment of equal risk. Suppose you won the lottery and were offered $1 million today or $1,050,000 one year from today. What should you choose? If you held out for one more year, you could have an additional $50,000. Well, a question to ask yourself is, if I accept the lower amount of $1 million today, is there an investment opportunity that could offer me returns of $50,000 or more? Suppose you have an investment that offers a 10% return 
and can be withdrawn without any penalties in one year. Should you take $1 million today and make the investment, or should you wait one year and receive $1,050,000? Remember the simple future value formula? Well, one of the variables in the future value formula was the present value. All that we need to do is rearrange the future value formula and we get the formula to solve for present value. What the present value formula is doing is reversing the future value formula. Now we have all the information needed to make our analysis. We have the future value of $1,050,000. We have our discount rate of 10% and our number of periods, which is only one year. When we plug these into the present value equation, you can see that the present value of receiving $1,050,000 in one year is worth $954,000. $545. That's $45,455 less than $1 million. With this analysis, you should choose the $1 million now instead of the $1,050,000 in the future. Understanding how to find present value is one of the most basic and necessary mathematical concepts in finance. As you build on this understanding, you'll be able to figure out the present value of multiple cash flows received from investments that make more than one single payment. Understanding this concept will help you price bonds, stocks, projects, and any other type of investment that requires both cash inflows and cash outflows. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to visit our Okay, a, a good video, the guy's voice is kind of creepy though, but a good video on explaining the basic concepts of present, uh, future and present value. But the key thing there is the definitions how the instructor did the problems in those formulas, that's okay to understand those formulas, but we're gonna do it in a spreadsheet format. That's where you'll do your answers. That's why how I like you to do your answers, do it, is understand and take those concepts and place them into a spreadsheet calculation where it can be done much quicker, where we're gonna do that throughout our course and various projects and investment returns. This is the way we want to learn that using our spreadsheets as a way of doing it. But the formulas are good. You can put that into a calculator. You can put that into calculate on your own. But I would like you to master this calculations in a uh, in using a spreadsheet. Now, in the assignment that you have this week, assignment two, I give you all different types of problems and questions concerning present and future value. How you calculate those, you determine. All right. You don't have to show me your calculations in the answers. All you have to do is show me the answers to the multiple choice or the short answer questions. So um, and just remember that you do not have to show me how you came up with the answers. Just show me the answers. And so uh, um, now in, f in future weeks and future work, we'll actually have spreadsheets wh where you'll be doing the present or future value calculations. But for this week, just do the find the answers and put them on your assignment sheet. Also, there's a question in the assignment this week about portfolio valuation, and we'll look at that in a few minutes. So I would I'm, I've picked some problems this week to from the textbook to act as examples of present and future value. Uh, problems 4, 11, uh, 14, 19, and 38, okay? I have given you a review lectured spreadsheet where I calculate these answers and show you, show you how to do them. Uh, this will help you with assignment number two, naturally, and so review these. This, these, uh, this video and review the spreadsheet on how to do these questions. Okay, here's a spreadsheet I have set up for my lecture video this week, which goes, or goes over samples of future, present value, annuities, cash flow, and amortization, all key parts of chapter five. And this spreadsheet is entitled Week Three Class Lecture Review for our course. So please uh, review it, look at the calculation cells on how I came up with that, and this will help you with your assignment and understanding future and present value as we go forward. In question, remember, the key thing in finance is to acquire assets that produce a return into the future. And those assets are funded by, and we've talked about this before, borrowing money and equity equity as being uh, selling uh, interest or equity shares in your 
business, either private or public stock, and making a profit somewhat called retained earnings. We looked at those examples in our financial statements in week number two. But in order to gauge whether we're going to make an adequate return in the assets that are going to develop cash flow and return into the future, we have to compare that future earning to what it's costing us today. And that's why it's so important to understand the present and future value concept in finance, because in order for you, a strategist, to make a decision about investing in an asset, knowing hopefully what its return will be, is it enough to cover the cost of acquiring those assets, the borrowing of money, the issuance of equity, the using of profits, or what is called in this video we just saw, the opportunity cost? What are we giving up to acquire those assets? So this is a very important concept. So in problem four, we look at a couple of the areas of future value. For example, if I had $100 today and I would invest it over 10 years, compounded annually at 8%, pretty good interest rate, what would that $100 be in 10 years? Well, I can use my spreadsheet and it's called the function spreadsheet, function file of the spreadsheet. And if you go to your spreadsheet, either Excel, Apple Numbers, Google Spreadsheets, and find the formula drop-down box, formulas, and go to insert function. Here's a whole list of functions that the spreadsheet can do for you. So I like to go to the category called financial, and I want to look at future value. What is the calculation or function for a future value? So that's FV. There it is right there returns the future value of an investment based on periodic constant payments and a constant interest rate. So what is the future value if I have $100 today invested at 8% annually for 10 years? So I go to that future value function and the interest rate in this case is 8%. Now you can put that in as either 8% or you can put it in as 0 0.08, the decimal. Remember, this is a 10-year investment. That's the num number of periods, 10 years. And its present value, what you're investing today, is $100. Notice I put this in as negative 100. If I put this in as just $100, the number I'll get is a negative. Now, the number is exactly right, but sometimes students get a little bit confused when they say, oh, this is a negative number. Did I do something wrong? No, it's just the computer calculation is taking the investment like money going out the hundred dollars is going out so that's considered negative cash flow but either way it's still the correct numbers but i like to type in 100 so i get a positive number so if i type that number in eight percent for 10 periods with a present value of a hundred dollars and hit okay and you'll see the answer right here it gives me 215 dollars and 89 cents all right, that's the future value of $100 invested every year at 10%. And the gentleman talked about that in the video. Well, if I want to take that out even longer, the same calculation, financial, future value, 8%. But now the number of periods are for 20 years. And still the present value is minus $100. But notice how that grows to $466.10. Right, so that gives us an idea. If I have some money today and I find an investment vehicle to put that into, I can determine its value. Let's say I have the same $100, but I'm in a little bit lower interest rate mode, probably a little bit more conservative investment, and it's 4% payable annually for 10 years. Function, financial, future value. Now it's 4% for 10 years, and the investment or the present value is still $100. Notice how it's only $148.02. That gives you an indication of, of that the interest rate will drive, naturally, and this is no big secret, the interest rate will drive the amount of return off that investment. Let's do the same thing now for 20 years. Function, financial, future value, 
sound like a recording here, I apologize. 4%, let's type this in now as 0 0.04. 20 periods and still the same $100. 219.11, okay? So that gives us an idea of what the future value is of something by taking the money and compounding it over a period of time. Now, naturally, if this was 10 years at 8% compounded quarterly, four times a year, what would that be? Well, let's take a look at this. If I had financial future value, this is an important concept. If I had a annual rate of 8%, but I'm compounding it quarterly for 10 years, that's four times a year. But first of all, four times a year, if an annual rate is 8%, that means the rate is 2% per quarter. Two, four, six, eight, four quarters in a year. So the rate is 2% per quarter, but how many, how many periods? 10 years at four quarters a year. So that's 40 periods. Present value, the future present value is still $100. And notice what happens. It's $220.80. So this is something very interesting. The same time period, but in this time period, I'm compounding it annually. In this, I'm compounding it quarterly over the same 10 years at 8% annual. Notice you're earning a little bit more interest. That's because it's being compounded quarterly. But yes, the, the interest rate per period is 2%, not 8%. But there's four periods in a year, thus equaling 8%. All right, let's see what that does for 20 years compounded quarterly. Financial, future value. Now it's 20 years compounded quarterly. Still, the interest rate is 2% per quarter per year. And number of periods now is 20 years at four, that's 80 periods. Still $100. And notice we get 487. Again, we're earning more interest than the compounded annually, compounded quarterly, a little bit more. And this is one of the big selling vehicles with a lot of investments, especially with money market funds or savings accounts or certificates of deposits. How they'll attract you as an investor in those things is because they'll say, well, it's compounded daily or compounded quarterly or compounded semi-annually, you get more compounding periods. But remember, when it, the, na the nature of the compounding means you take the annual rate and divide it by how many times you're compounding it. So if I have a 2%, excuse me, 3% savings account, but it's compounded daily, that means the interest rate per period would be 3%, 0 0.03, 0 0.03 divided by 365 days in a year. So the interest rate per period is is, is really kind of tiny. So you got to remember that when it comes time to compounding on a number of periods and how many times you compound it based on the annual year of being 12 months. So that's an important concept in finance. Future value. Now, Let's take a look at what present value means. Remember, future value is I have $100. I put it out for 4% for 20 years. I get 219.11. Well, let's say the present value is, is what is the future? If I know the future value is $219.11, what is its present value today over that time period? In other words, taking future amounts and determining what their value is today. All right, that's an interesting scenario. But we'll keep it in the context of the same interest rate. So let's say I have a $215.89 to be received in 10 years in the future. All right. If I take that and discount it back at 5%, let's say my current inflation rate is 5%. So I'm going to make 8% over 10 years, but the current cost of money in the economy is 5%. Well, what is my real return on this on this investment in today's dollars? Taking into account the discount rate, or in this case, inflation. All right, so let's do it. Formula, 
function, but now we go to a different calculation. We have the future value amount. We want to know the present value amount. So financial, and I go to PV, present value. There it is right there. Returns the present value of investment, the, the whole amount that a series of future payments is worth today. Now, so again, I said, okay, I'll do that. What's the interest rate? Well, that's my discount rate, 5%. That's the inflation rate. The number of periods is 10 years. And now here, the future value is $215.89. I put in it as minus 215.89. So in other words, I know I have 215.89 in the future at this 8% return, but my inflation rate today is 5%. What is this really worth? $132 and 54 cents, dramatically different from the 215.89, but I'm still making money. It just so happens that I'm not making as much money because anticipated inflation is gonna eat, eat, eat away of that over the next few years. Make sense? Let's take a look at the 5% discount applied to the 20 year future value. Formula, function, financial, PV, present value. The discount rate is, or the inflation rate, let's put that in as 0 0.05. Number of periods now is 20. And the future value is 466.10. So now we're going to discount that over 20 years at 5%. And we're still doing okay, 175.67. That's met over $100. But it's far different cry from the 466.10 of the future value. That's how much inflation eats in to that amount. The difference between 175.67 and 466.10, that is called the true value of this investment. See what that means? So that, this is, comes in handy when you're trying to determine, oh, I, they tell me I'm going to make 8% of this into the future, but I know that the, right now our discount rate is 5%. How much does that cut into my return? Let's do it again now for the 4% interest rate. We know the future value is 148.02, formula, function, present value. Rate is 5%. Now the number of periods is 10. And the future value is 148.02. And there's the discount. Now, as you can see in this case, which makes sense, we're returning or the future value is at 4%, but the inflation rate is 5%. Whoops, $90.87. Now, that tells us that uh, in some respects, for, that's not a very good investment. They say we're going to earn 4%, but with the inflation rate at 5%, I'm losing money, which kind of makes sense. But in some, sometimes many people will still make that investment at 4% because does that mean because the 5% inflation rate is today's inflation, maybe that starts falling over the future, okay? Or also it's a safe investment and I just don't want to worry about the money. So I lose a couple of bucks with inflation. I don't care. It's safe. And it's not like a stock uh, or a real estate investment that could change dramatically over the next 10 years. It's a safe investment. But there's, there's an example of where inflation eats away all the future value. Let's do it again for the 20 year investment. Formula, function, financial, present value, five percent. Now it's 20 periods discounted and the future value is 219.11. And what is that worth? Oof, even worse because the money's out there longer at a in that five percent inflation rate into the future. Oof. We're, we're gonna nail there by the inflation in relationship to the 4% interest rate. And th this is another indicator why people in the economy and financial managers and accountants and people running businesses freak out in high inflationary times. 
Because if you invest in an asset with a certain amount of return into the future and inflation is increasing or staying high for a long period of time, it eats away at the return you're going to generate off that investment. And so why would I want to invest in an asset now? Why don't I just wait and see what happens with the inflation getting lower to warrant that return that's going to be generated off that asset? And that's exactly why in high inflationary times, people get nervous because it probably and usually slows down the economy because people say, well, I'm not going to invest in assets now. I'm not going to buy things because I'm going to wait for the cost of money to drop down. So it gives me that future growth I want in that asset. And this is a way of calculating this. Very important. Let's look at problem 11 in the text that gives us further practice of this. Problem 11 at the end of chapter five is another, in this case, a present value calculation, which we just practice, but also it's asking you to interpret the answer, which you're going to be doing a lot of in the future weeks of this class is doing a calculation of a present or future value, but then explaining it or understanding what that information tells you. Here's a good problem to practice that. You can buy property today for $3 million, sounds like Claremont, and sell it in five years for $4 million. You earn no rental income on the property. So in other words, I can buy, invest in a piece of real estate today for $3 million, and, and they tell me that in five years, due to the market, that this asset will be worth $4 million in the future. If the current interest rate, opportunity cost, discount rate, whatever you want to call it, is 8%, what is the present value of the sales price? And is the property investment attracted attractive to you based on that growth from three to 4 million in five years, but with an interest rate of 8%. Let's take a look at that. So let's take a look at this review of investment, which many of us maybe already do in, in real estate or investments. We're told that we are investing $3 million in problem 11, and it's going to grow to $4 million at the end of five years. But the interest rate on money or the discount rate of that money in over that period is 8%. Is this an attractive investment, 3 million turning into 4 million in an interest rate period of 8%? Well, we wanna determine the present value of that $4 million. Formula, function, financial, present value, PV. Our discount rate is 8%. The number of periods is five years. The future value is $4 million. Whoops, 2,722,333. Notice I've rounded the answer. If you go to your home screen, right up here, you can round it. So if I decide to go to the decimal of pennies, there it is right there, 79 cents. But Mr. Hassey likes all these numbers rounded. It's a thing with him. So it's 2,722,333. So an investment of $3 million grows to $4 million in an environment, though, of 8%. Is this an attractive investment? No, it is not we're actually losing money with the higher inflationary or a higher interest rate. Again, another example of high interest rates affecting the value of money being received in the future, comparing it to its present value today. This is not good. And many, this is what many investors do in a period of time to practice that or to review investments into the future. And if any of you are in the real estate business and looking at markets and how growth in markets, does the growth exceed the cost of the money or the inflation rate into the future? In this case, in, in problem 11, it does not. Thus, it's a loser as far as relationship to the investment and what is actual present value projected. Very good analysis. Notice in these first two, three problems, we're looking at one lump sum payment, $100. 
3 million. Now in problem 14, we look at the concept of what is the future or present value of money over a period of time of cash flows. Let's take a look at that. Here's problem 14 in the text textbook at the top of page 155, excuse me, 155. What is the present value of the following cash flow stream if the interest rate is 6%? Remember the difference now between problems four and 11, it's a series of monies, whereas problem four and 11 was one lump sum, $100, $3 million, turning into $4 million. But now, and this is something that we're going to be doing a lot of in about three weeks, capital budgeting, is looking at a series of cash flows generated off an investment. And here, this is generating, after year one, $200 after year two, an additional $400, after year three, an additional $300. So that's $900 return over three years. What is the present value of this $900 taking into account the 6% interest rate? There's a couple of ways of doing this on your spreadsheet. And let's take a look at that. Okay, here's a... Um, Here's the spreadsheet. We have cash flow of, as we just said, $200 at the end of year one. Get that out of there. $300, excuse me, $400 after year, in year two and $300 in year three. So that's $900. What is its current value in an interest rate of 6%? Well, the first way to do that is just take it period by period. Year one, what is the present value of $200 at 6%? Year two, $400 at 6% and so on. Add them all up and there's the current value or present value of that $900. Let's do that. Formula, function, financial, present value. Remember when the money is in the future and we want to find its value today, it's present value. So remember, all right, what's our interest rate? Well, it's 6%, 0 0.06. For one period, the first year, its future value or the cash flow generated that first year is $200. There's the present value after year one. Let's go to year two. Formula, function, financial, present value. Again, 6%. Now it's not one period, but two periods. Year two, its future value over that the second year is $400 to be received in the second year. There's the present value of that $400 discounted back at 6%. And then finally, year three. Formula, financial, function, present value. Practice these on your spreadsheet and see if you come up with my answers. Then you know you got it. Again, the discount rate is 6%. Now it's for three periods, year three. Notice every period changes here with the cash flow. The future value, we're getting $300 in year three. 251.89, and there it is. On an investment of $700, notice in the problem they told us we are investing $700, we're generating $900 in return. Thus, we have what is called a net present value of the difference. The total of the present values of year one, two, and three are 796.56. We have an investment of $700, thus, we're making in today's dollars, $96.56, right? That's what is called the present value of cash flow. A very important concept that we'll practice a lot in the coming weeks. That's one way of doing it, taking present value of year one, two, and three and doing it individual. Well, what happens if you get a project that's 20 years long? This can become a little tedious doing year by year. There's another way of doing this in one formula. And here it is. Formula, functions, financial, 
And instead of PV, we go to NPV, net present value. It returns the net present value of investment based on a, num a series of future payments in one formula. So instead of doing it year by year that we're doing it here, we're doing it in one deal. And here it is. The rate, 6%. The rate cha never changes, so it's 6%. Under value, all you do now is paint the cash flow, year one, two, and three. So you notice there in the formula, it's got D28 through D30. That's the cells. So it's looking at the cells and see it's right here, 200, 400, 300. And now it's going to take that entire row or that, or that entire column and discount it at 6%. And look what we get. Exactly the same as we did year by year, but it sure took a lot quicker by using the NPV formula. Now, you can only use the NPV formula if the interest rate or the discount rate is the same over that time period. If you have 6% in year one and 5% in year two, you can't do that. You have to have the same consistent interest rate over the period of time. If you do, you can save yourself a lot of tedious year-by-year -year steps by using the NPV formula in your function code. And please remember this one because you're going to be doing a lot of this come weeks five and six in our class. So in summation, we've now taken a look at the future value and present values of single lump sum payments. We've taken a look now at the present value of a series of cash flows in problem 14. And then you're going to be looking at other examples like the, of this in problem 19 and 38 in your textbook. And in my Saturday video, I will be reviewing those problems. But this gives you a good head start on your assignment two work for this week. One last thing that I want to go over, which is another topic of chapter five, time value of money, is the concept of amortization. An amortized loan. Many of you probably have heard of that. Amortized loan is the amount uh, when you borrow some money and you pay it back in equal payments over a period of time. All right. Many of you probably know this, a mortgage, a car loan. When you have equal payments over time, that's an amortized loan. And the reason why it's amortized is the lender, probably the bank or the, or the car credit organization, gets their money, both principal and interest every month. That's what's attractive to it for the lender is they get their money, both interest and principal, over the course of the payback period of the loan. This is a very important concept in the term of financing projects is an amortized loan and what it means. You need to be familiar with this. You do not need to be familiar with putting together this spreadsheet, but I'm going to do it anyway so you can see how it all works. You just need to be familiar with what is the definition of an amortized loan. Here's an example in this spreadsheet. Let's say we want to buy a car for $40,000. Can't be much of a car these days. And we're going to put a down payment down of $2,000. So that means we're going to finance through the bank or through the credit union or the credit card, credit company of the automobile dealership. We're going to finance $38,000. So we go to them and say, okay, we'd like to take out a four year loan of this $38,000 to buy this automobile. My credit rating is a FICO score of 650. If anybody's familiar with what FICO is, it gives you your credit rating. So as if any of you have gone to a car dealership or gone for a loan at a bank, this is the most creepiest times of all, is when they say, okay, we'll be right back with you. We're gonna see what your FICO score is and whether you qualify for this loan, all right? So with a FICO score of 650, they come back and says, yes, you qualify. Your interest rate on this car loan when you're borrowing $38,000 is 6.5% a year. So you, but that's pretty good credit. All right. So now our task is, okay, for four years, that's 48 payments, 12 payments a year. That's 48 payments. What is going to be my payment per month 
of this $38,000 loan. So I can calculate this, and this is exactly what credit agencies do. First of all, they determine what is your interest rate per period. Well, if I'm borrowing six at 6.5% six per year, that's the interest rate based on my credit score. So all I do my interest rate per period is to take the 6.5%, 0.065, and divide it by 12 months. 12 months in a year, my annual rate is six and a half. What is my interest rate per month? There it is right there, 0.00541667. All right, that's my interest rate per period, six and a half percent divided by 12 months. That's in decimal for a percent. It really would be 0.54%, but in a decimal for the percent, it's 0 0.0054. Okay. What is my payment going to be? Well, now we can go back to our formulas and calculate this on our own. And this is what credit agencies do. Formula, function, financial. And now I can go to what is called payment, PMT. There it is right there, PMT. Calculates the payment of a loan based on constant payments and constant interest rates. So a, an adjustable mortgage or an adjustable rate or an adjustable interest rate over time, you can't do, use this payment function because the interest rate changes. But if you have consistent interest rates, 6.5% for the entire four years of loan, you can calculate your payment. So now I bring up this function and I put in my rate per period, what I just calculated, 0 0.00541666. Number of periods, it's a four-year loan, monthly payments, 48 periods. And my present value, how much am I borrowing? $38,000. Here's the moment of truth. $901.17 is how much I'm going to pay per month for 48 periods or four years. Ouch. In return, I get a thirty-eight, a $40,000 automobile. And let me show you how this all works. Let's say I know I'm borrowing $38,000 and my payment is nine oh one seventeen, which we just calculated. My interest per an uh, interest rate will be the thirty-eight thousand times my interest rate per period. Point zero zero five four one six 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 seven. That's my interest rate for this first payment, two hundred and five dollars and eighty-three cents. All right. Well, if I take nine oh one seventeen minus the interest payment of that loan for that period, I have a principal, the difference of 695.34. That brings my ending balance of the loan. That means I'm going to pay off $695.34 of that loan in the first payment. Again, I take down this in the second period of the loan, the next month, 901.17. And now my interest rate, again, is going to be now this balance times that interest rate per period, point zero zero five four one six 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 seven there we go oops and now i subtract oh i put in the wrong payment that makes sense nine oh one seventeen sorry there we go all right so notice notice my interest goes down because why the balancing balance is dropping i paid it off partially and now six ninety foot nine ten is my balance and there's my ending, my principal, there's my ending balance. So now if I just take this and copy it all the way down to period 48, watch what happens. I paid off the loan. 10 cents, century. the bank owes me 10 cents. But notice of making equal payments every month, which is the definition of an amortized loan, I'm paying back 43,256.16, of which 5,256 is interest, and the balance would be the principal on the loan, and I've paid it back. That's how car loans work. That's how mortgages work. It's taking your FICO score to determine what you qualify for risk, 
interest rate, interest rate per period, and you can calculate the payment over that time period. And here's what an amortization schedule looks like for a loan. Banks, car loans, amortized financing is all based on this concept. The key thing for us as financial corporate business finance people is just to understand the concept of amortized loans where interest and principal are paid back every period, but over the life of the loan, the interest drops because you're paying off more of the principal as time goes on. That's what an amortized loan is. Next week in chapter in our discussions in week four, we're going to look at bonds. Bonds are a form of financing or borrowing for corporations where it is a non-amortized loan. Non-amortized meaning a bond is all you have to do is pay interest during the life of the debt and the principal is paid at the maturity. Why? Because in a corporation, they have more collateral and less risk. So funding agencies will give them the benefit of the doubt. They only pay interest during the life of the debt and just have to pay the principal back at maturity. You and I, because we don't have much collateral, have to have an amortized loan where the lender gets their interest after every period because we have less collateral, thus the loan is riskier they want to get their interest now and principal now instead of a bond is just interest only, no principal into maturity. That's a key concept. The difference between personal finance, amortization, and corporate finance, non-amortization. And we'll talk about that next week. So here's a great spreadsheet which will be posted to your lecture notes for week number three that you can review with this video. And these are all samples of discussion problems in our assignment number two. Now let's take a look at what I would like you to do to update your portfolio this week, number three. Okay, here is assignment number two for our fall session here in week three. And we have uh, multiple guess problems about time value of money where you do the calculations and select best answer. There they are right there. And then you have question number two, which is worth 10 points, where I'm asking you to update your portfolio as of September 8th, Friday and find what is the current beta of your portfolio. And this is the discussion we'll have next week, the beta or risk assessment of a company or of a stock. You go to Yahoo Finance right on the front page of your, of your company. It'll give you the beta of that company. If there's no number there, then you don't have to worry about it. But I want to know what is the beta. And it might be a good idea to find out what you think, what beta represents for your each of your companies in your portfolio the amount of dollars in amount of dollars and percent of gains and losses of your portfolio and a comparison to those gains and losses to how the dow the s p 500 and the nasdaq have changed from august 25th to september 8th and just answer this question did you better the markets through the first three weeks of your portfolio explain did you do better than the markets? This information here, the amount of dollars, gains and losses in percent will give you that answer. So if we go to our portfolio, here's my portfolio as of August 25th. You guys, and all of you did it this way or pretty much close to this way on the 25th. Here's my four companies. I allocated 25,000 each to each company. Here was the price of my stock for each company. And I divided that price into the investment to get the number of shares rounded to the nearest whole number. Remember, if I didn't round it, the number would look like this, but I wanted a rounded number. And there we go right there. And here's the market indicators on August 25th, the Dow, the S&P and the NASDAQ, and all those are defined 
in weeks one, two, and three of our Blackboard. So now what I would like you to do is update this as of September 8th, this Friday. What I did here is I just took this work from last week and copied it down just below it. And here we go. And I changed the date to September 8th. And naturally on September 8th, Friday at the close of the market, I'll put in the new price here. And one of the things you need to remember here is when you copied this down, you copied the formulas that you had in this cell. So you're gonna to have to copy it again by copying these share price, share purchase numbers, copying them, control C, and bring it down here. And now you're gonna copy and just paste the values right here. Just paste the values. In other words, right here, you see there's my formula taking the price of Apple and dividing into the investment. But if I go down here now, if I just copied and pasted the value, the number, here it is right there. You see 139,969, which is rounded to 140. Notice each one of these cells now has the values there, no formulas. And the reason why you do that is because now you're going to take, once you get the new prices on Friday, you're going to take the price of your stock on Friday and in this cell, multiply it. In other words, equals the price of the new value on September 8th times the shares, that cell, and you'll get your new value. So let's say Apple goes up to $180 a share. I now have made $194.56 since in the last three weeks on Apple. I bought it at 178.61. I calculated 140 shares. Now on Friday, I'm going to take the $180 price at the close of September 8th, multiply it times the shares I purchased on the 25th of August, and I'll get my new value. And notice if everything else stayed the same, I made $194.56 for this period of time. What would that be in a percentage? Well, I would put in this formula equals this number, the ending value of September 8th minus the beginning value of August 25th. I would put those in parentheses, isolating them. And then I would divide that by my original 100,000. And I get a number. A decimal, 0 0.00194. I convert that to a percent here and go to two decimal points. So I have made 0.19% in a percent or $194.56 in three weeks. I'm going to copy this spreadsheet and put it in my lecture notes for this week to help you do that. You're going to do the same thing for the market. So whatever the Dow is on September 8th, the S&P and the NASDAQ, you're going to calculate here how the Dow has changed from the 8th to the 9th, from the 8th to the 25th in a percent. What is the percent change in the Dow in those three weeks? The same in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So let's just do this for, let's say the Dow goes to 35,000 and the S&P goes to 4,400, and the NASDAQ goes to 13,6 on Friday. So right here, I would take equals this minus the original Dow index. There's the change. I would just now copy this over, and there's all the numerical changes. Remember, this is not in dollars. This is an index. So that's how it's changed. So now I'm going to take that amount that I've changed and divide it by the original Dow. And now I convert that to a percent, two decimal places, 1.8. So the Dow has gone up 1.87% in these three weeks. Oops. And now I'm going to copy that formula over. And so I have not beaten the Dow. I have beaten the S&P 500. And I have beaten the NASDAQ. So I did pretty good. I just got a little bit behind the Dow. 
in my, so did I better the market? Yes, I bettered the S&P 500 and I bettered the NASDAQ. I wanna see that. Did you beat the markets? And I did not beat the Dow. So you're gonna to have to update your portfolio with your prices as of September 8th, calculate the new dollar value and determine the change from your August 25th value and find the Dow, new Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ for the eighth and calculate what has happened to those over the course of the three weeks. And that's what I want to see on your portfolio file that's going to be turned in to Blackboard as a separate file, spreadsheet file, for your assignment two this week. I don't want a PDF. I don't want uh, this. I want to see just this stuff. And many of you have already done that. Now, some of you have yet to update your portfolio files from August 25th per my recommendations to you to do that. So if you have not updated your file, you're dealing with wrong information. If you submit that file that you gave me on August 25th without the corrections, you're going to get the assignment two problem wrong because your index numbers are wrong or your calculations are incorrect. So make sure you update your files per the grade that you received in week one, and then incorporate that in your assignment two analysis right here. So that's, and I'm gonna post this to the lecture notes so you can see what I've done, so you can act accordingly with your own spreadsheet. I don't wanna see every day. I don't wanna see multiple periods. I wanna see August 25th, and September 8th in your spreadsheet file for assignment two. Then we're gonna update this again later on in the course for a new update period. How are we doing though after three weeks of our portfolios? That's what I wanna see in your question answer for a question two answer for assignment two. Okay, so there is our lecture video for this week three, past, present, future in finance. The time value of money. In my update video on Saturday, I will review question problems 19 and 38 from chapter five. I will review the assignment number one answers and solutions and go over those with you because those grades will be posted before Saturday of this week and you can see your grades and the solutions and I will review that in my Saturday video. At the same time, we have our student hours this Thursday night from six to eight o'clock if you need to chat with me. Review your grades as they are now after in the second in the third week of our course. Make sure you understand where you are in our class especially after the assignment number one grades are posted during, during the week. So thank you, everybody. We'll see you again on Saturday of this week three in corporate finance. Adios.